Thank you. And before I turn to the first question, uh, can I just advise members that I've had the opportunity to uh, ask all the party leaders or to be in touch with all the party leaders to ask for shorter questions and answers this week. Uh, that will give more space for backbenchers to make contributions. I hope it will also make for uh, snappier and more effective contributions. And I live in hope that my exhortation is adhered to. And on that note, Jackson Carlo. <laughs> Well, after that lengthy introduction, presiding officer, <laughs> thousands of Scots every day commute across central Scotland into Edinburgh and Glasgow. Could the First Minister explain to them why a car park tax imposed on them by a local authority whose politicians they don't elect and in whose region they don't live is a good example of local decision making? Yeah. First Minister. Of course. This would be a discretionary power for councils, a power that under a Tory government councils in England already have, and the kind of localism that Tories uh, have been demanding in this chamber for some time. Uh, but I noted that Jackson Carlaw uh, launched a campaign in Edinburgh this morning, and he's mentioned Edinburgh in his question, which I thought was really interesting. Because you see, just a few months ago, uh, there was a motion passed at the Transport Committee of Edinburgh City Council. It said this, to note the merits and principle of pursuing the power for Edinburgh to introduce a workplace parking levy. It was tabled by Councillor Nick Cook, Conservative. <laughs> seconded by Councillor Scott Douglas, Conservative, and voted for by Councillor Graham Bruce, Conservative. Would Jackson Carlaw uh, care to explain that, how can I put this delicately, inconsistency? Jackson Carlaw. Uh, the First Minister. The First Minister wants to talk about Edinburgh City Council. Tory councillors noted the need for an economic assessment, First Minister. Yeah, exactly. What the entire country has noted is that you want to impose a £500 car park tax on them with no assessment whatsoever. So, do I, do I support a back-of-the-fag packet policy that threatens low workers with a regressive tax? No, I do not. Does the First Minister not understand what this means to ordinary people across Scotland? This is the equivalent to many people's monthly rent. So I assume from the First Minister's answer that she is now the cheerleader-in-chief for people being punished for going to work with no say, far less a vote over that decision. But the SNP's position on the car park tax is more confused than that. On Wednesday, SNP Minister Kate Forbes said this, a key principle born of Adam Smith is that taxes should be proportionate to the ability to pay. Can the First Minister explain how this entirely admirable principle, which has so rightly inspired Kate Forbes, is even remotely met if a call centre worker earning less than £20,000 a year has to pay the same car park tax as a company director earning five times as much? First Minister. Yes, hello. Well, knows. Uh, the SNP government would not impose anything on anybody. This is a discretionary power that councils, that councils in England already have. Uh, it would be a proposed levy that councils could uh, propose uh, on employers, not employees. Uh, and this is what the Tories used to believe. We believe that decisions should be taken as locally as possible and that power should lie with politicians elected as locally as possible. I'm not sure when they changed their minds on that. But you know, I've been wondering if there was a reason other than naked hypocrisy uh, for the Tories' position on this. Uh, and I wonder if it might be something to do with this. Uh, just at the end of last year, the Tories on Angus Council introduced car parking charges at 33 public car parks in Carnoustie, Arbroath, Forfar, Kerry Muir, Brecon and Montrose. On Eastern Bartonshire Council, uh, the Tories last year increased car parking charges and they scrapped free parking. And in Argyll and Butte Council, the Tories imposed on car parks in Arica an 800% increase in car parking. So here we have it, presiding officer. 
The Tories don't want to give powers to councils because clearly the Tories don't trust Tory councils. Jackson Carlo. So, so it's the Henry McLeish defence. It wasn't me, it was a councillor who had done it. But, but, you, but you are responsible, First Minister, because you and the SNP MSPs are going to vote for it this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And every single Scottish Conservative Council Group leader has now emphatically said they will not support a car park tax in their area. And every single Scottish Conservative MSP will oppose the car park tax in their constituency or region. But what about the First Minister? She's a constituency MSP in Glasgow. So what's her view? If as a result of powers voted for by SNP MSPs, the SNP leadership of Glasgow City Council proposed charging hundreds of pounds each year for workplace parking, would she support them? Yes or no? First Minister. That is up to local councils to do the assessment and to make the case. That presumably, that presumably is what you mean by decisions taken as locally as possible and power lying with politicians elected as locally as possible. But I just, I just want to, you know, get to the heart. Let's get to the heart of the Tory position here. The Tory position, as I understand it, is if, the, is if the SNP government devolve a tax to councils and councils decide to use that power, that becomes an SNP government tax. So can I ask Jackson Carlaw, is it the case that given that the Tory government devolved income tax powers to the Scottish government, is the Scottish government's use of those powers a Tory tax? Because that sounds ridiculous, but that is the logic of the Tory position. So this afternoon in the budget debate, I look forward to all of us calling the income tax decisions of this Scottish Government a Tory tax. That's the logic of Jackson Carlo. Jackson Carlo. So bluntly, so bluntly, it sounds as if the First Minister doesn't know if she's in favour of her own policy being imposed on her own constituents by her own SNP Council. Presiding officer, we will oppose the budget deal when it comes before Parliament this afternoon. And frankly, SNP members should too. As it breaks their own manifesto promises on both the council tax and on the basic rate of income tax. As we learned earlier this week, it risks precious tax revenue, which pays for our schools and hospitals being lost to Scotland as people take their money elsewhere. And worst of all, it is as a tax that says to people across this country, trying to do the right thing, trying to juggle school drop-offs with work, trying to keep Scotland going, and in many cases working unsociable hours when there is no public transport provision, that they are to be punished. Yeah. All week we've seen SNP ministers desperately distance themselves from the car park tax, yeah. and now even the First Minister won't say whether she backs it or not. It's a simple question. If they don't back it, why should anybody? Why should we? Yeah. First Minister. I back councils having the power to decide because we don't just preach localism and empowering councils, we practice at that principle. A discretionary power that councils could use to help tackle pollution, cut emissions and yes, invest in public transport. And I say again, presiding officer, exactly uh, the localism that Tories have been demanding and exactly the power uh, that a UK Tory government allows councils in England to already have. Uh, isn't it the case, presiding officer, that I've got a wealth of evidence, I've gone through some of it here today, that the Tories do not oppose giving this power to councils in principle. They only actually uh, oppose it when it is the SNP proposing it. It is, presiding officer, to coin a phrase hypocrisy on stilts. And I hope that Jackson Carlow had more success when he used to sell second-hand cars than he'll have in peddling that line. <laughs> Question number two, Richard Leonard. Richard Leonard, order please. Presiding Richard Leonard. Officer. 
presiding officer, just yesterday, school pupils across Argyll and Butte took to the streets to protest against cuts to local youth services. They understand the impact that £230 million worth of cuts to Scotland's councils will mean. Does the First Minister? First Minister. Well, I, uh, as we saw last week, I always applaud uh, young people taking an interest in the decisions that affect uh, their lives, and that applies to young people in Argyll and Butte as it does to young people uh, campaigning for greater action on climate change. But Richard Leonard is just wrong uh, when he talks about cuts to uh, the local government budget. This afternoon, in the budget, uh, we will propose uh, a budget that increases the resources that councils have to spend. Uh, we will ensure uh, that councils have more uh, resources in revenue terms, more resources in capital terms, more resources overall. And in addition to that, we will give councils, as we've just been debating, more flexibility in the revenue that they raise. I think that's a good thing. And I think it's incumbent on Richard Leonard, when he didn't bring forward a single proposal uh, for any changes to the budget, to say why he will vote against that this afternoon. Richard Leonard. The First Minister talks about more resources for Scotland's councils. So let's examine what more resources for Scotland's councils looks like on the ground. Later today, SNP run Dundee Council will propose a budget which will cut children's education in the city. That will mean cutting education resource workers, cutting pupil support workers, cutting primary and early years assistance even cutting 26 teaching posts from the city's primary schools. All of this at a time when school roles in the city are rising. So can the First Minister explain why she stands up in this chamber claiming that education is her top priority and then sets a budget that out in the real world means cuts, cuts to teachers and cuts to education? First Minister. Well, let me just Yet again, give Richard Leonard the facts. Uh, the budget proposed uh, that Parliament will vote on this afternoon increases local government day-to-day -day spending for local revenue services, including education, uh, of £287.5 million. An increase in capital spending of £207.6 million and greater flexibility to raise revenue. Those are the facts. But I'll give Richard Leonard, I'll give Richard Leonard Order, a please. Final Let's opportunity. listen to the First Minister. Order, please. The final vote on the budget will take place at five o'clock today. So he's still got a few hours. If he wants us to spend more on local government, which line in the budget should we take that money from? Should it be health? Should it be social care? I'm waiting. He's got the opportunity now to do it. Let's hear what his proposal is. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, here's a fact. It's not just Dundee where cuts to council funding are hitting children's education. In SNP run Clack Manorshire, Scottish Government cuts are so deep that council officers propose closing both Coles Norton and Fishcross primary schools. Only a campaign led by parents stopped them. But children in Clack Manorshire still face cuts. School transport is being axed. Class sizes are being increased and two and a half hours is being cut from the school week. Nicola Sturgeon came into office promising to cut class sizes, but 12 years on, too many children will be in bigger classes because of her budget, and they will be spending less time being taught in those classes because of her budget. First Minister, if education is your defining mission and young people are your sacred responsibility. Why are you imposing £230 million worth of cuts on Scotland's councils? First well, Minister. To put it bluntly, we are not. But, you know, I guess, I guess if we wound the clock back to round about this time last year, Richard Leonard would be standing up uh, again claiming the education budgets uh, across the country were going to be cut. Here's what happened in this financial year. Uh, local authorities uh, set education budgets this year that were 3.8% higher than the budgets they set the year yeah. before. Yeah. That's a 2.3% real terms increase yeah. in their planned spend 
on education. So those are the facts. Uh, and no matter how hard Richard Leonard tries, he cannot uh, negate those facts. But again, you know, one last chance. Before five o'clock today, if he wants us to spend more on local government, he has an opportunity to come forward and say where that will come from. The only proposal that came from Labour benches was ruled out by Richard Leonard. He's got no credibility in asking for more money if he won't say where that money is going to come from. Thank you very much. We've got a number of constituency questions. The first from David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, Irish Laundry announced the closure of its factory in Kirkcaldy by the beginning of April with an unanticipated loss of 86 jobs. Can the First Minister please advise what the Scottish Government can do to support employees facing redundancy? First Minister. Well, I was very concerned uh, that Ellis Laundry had, has announced the closure of its factory in Kirkcaldy with the potential loss of uh, many jobs. Uh, I understand that the proposal is that the site will close at the end of March and the business will transfer to Inshinnan. Uh, the PACE partnership has already engaged with Ellis Laundry and has worked with the employees affected over recent weeks uh, and I can assure David Torrance that the partnership will continue to provide uh, the support that employees need uh, to help them at this very difficult time. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, a constituent in Highland Perthshire has asked me to raise concerns about ambulance cover in the area. On the 20th of January, a 999 call for an ambulance in a life-threatening uh, situation it took one hour and 46 minutes for a rapid response unit to attend and two hours and 14 minutes for an ambulance to follow up. Fortunately, the patient in question has recovered. But does the First Minister consider that these timescales are acceptable and what steps will be taken to improve the level of ambulance cover in rural Perthshire? First Minister. Well, I'm uh, grateful to Murdo Fraser for raising that. Can he uh, please pass my good wishes back to his constituent? Uh, our ambulance service does an excellent job, and I'm sure uh, members across the chamber would want to recognise that. I don't know all of the details of this particular case, certainly from what Murdo Fraser has narrated. That uh, kind of response time does not uh, appear to me to be acceptable. However, I will ask uh, the Health Secretary to look into uh, the circumstances to discuss them with the Scottish Ambulance Service and to write to Murdo Fraser when she has more information. Monica Lennon to be followed by Brian Whittle. First Minister, after the Clinical Waste Company Healthcare Environmental Services Limited ceased its services to the NHS, boards continued to pay the company and it has been reported that boards still owe HES £450,000. Meanwhile, HES workers still haven't been paid their final wages after they were let go at Christmas. Does the First Minister agree with me that any outstanding payments from the NHS boards to HES should be used to create a special fund for HES staff who cannot afford to be out of pocket any longer? First Minister. Well, can I say uh, to Monica Lennon, I, f firstly, I understand the sentiment behind her question, and I think we would all uh, share the sense of anger uh, when any employees are treated uh, less uh, than uh, ideally, uh, which is certainly the case uh, here. On the issue of the payments, my understanding is that any payments that were made to this company uh, were for services that had already been delivered before uh, the companies uh, went into uh, its ad administration and therefore health boards were contractually legally obliged to make those payments and I'm sure Monica Lennon can understand that position. We will continue to do everything we can though to help the employees uh, concerned and the health secretary I'm sure would be happy to talk to Monica Lennon further about the further actions the Scottish Government is able to take. Brian Whittle to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if I could uh, draw the uh, First Minister's uh, attention to the Bolton landfill site, which has now uh, gone 250 days since the, the company that was running that site uh, went into liquidation. Uh, and since then, the pumps have been switched off and there's been no flaring. And there's increasing evidence of contaminants leaching into uh, the ground and into the air and into the water. And at a recent stakeholders meeting, it was unclear where the responsibility lay for that health and safety. And I wonder if I get the opportunity, if the First Minister could tell me where those lines of responsibility lie in keeping uh, that site safe. First Minister. 
I, I'm not able to give all of that information to Brian Whittle uh, right now. I will undertake uh, to raise this with the Environment Secretary um, and to come back to him as quickly as possible about our understanding of where lines of accountability are and also the action the Scottish Government can take uh, to try to reach a resolution of what certainly uh, seems to be a deeply unsatisfactory uh, situation. I can understand that people in the local area uh, will be very concerned about any prospect of contamination and it is uh, absolutely necessary that all relevant agencies and organisations respond as quickly as possible. And Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A woman in Caithness has bravely shared her experience of giving birth under the current maternity provisions there. She was pregnant with twins when she went into labour at 30 weeks. She went to the Caithness General Hospital to be told after examination that she would be transferred by road to Inverness, over 100 miles away and a two and a half hour drive. Halfway into that journey, they had to stop at a community hospital in Galsby, where the first twin was born breech. The air ambulance was then tasked, but because it would take two hours to arrive, the first twin would be sent by road to Inverness. The helicopter could not land. Another air ambulance was tasked, but this would take too long. Therefore, a second ambulance resumed the journey to Inverness, where the second twin was born. Thankfully, after a prolonged stay in hospital, all are now doing well. However, it begs the question, why was the air ambulance or emergency retrieval team not tasked initially airlifting the mum from Caithness? Will the First Minister investigate this and will she make sure that the air ambulance treats situations like this as a priority? First Minister. Um, yeah, yes, I will investigate that specific question and firstly can I ask uh, Rhoda Grant to convey my good wishes to uh, the family in her constituency. As Rhoda Grant uh, knows, uh, mothers uh, about to give birth would be transferred from Caithness only when that was considered to be in line with uh, patient safety. Why the air ambulance wasn't immediately uh, tasked in this case is not something uh, I have the information on uh, now uh, in the chamber, but I will ask the health secretary to look into that this afternoon and uh, come back to Rhoda Grant, both with an explanation of that, but also uh, any further consideration that we think is required in light of that to ensure uh, that where possible, uh, the right uh, method of transferring uh, mothers uh, is tasked at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Question number three, Willie Rennie. New information suggests that John Yule could have survived if the police had responded to an emergency call in time. But we know both he and Lamara Bell died when they were left at the side of the M9 motorway for three days. The accident happened four years ago but there is still no fatal accident inquiry. And they are not alone. Our research has found that families across Scotland wait for up to eight years for a fatal accident inquiry into the death of their loved ones. Can the First Minister tell these families why on earth it is taking so long for them to get the answers that they deserve? First Minister. Well. Can I thank Willie Rennie for raising this issue? I would take the opportunity, given uh, that he had raised this issue, of once again placing on the record my uh, deepest sympathies to the families of John Yule and Lamara Bell. What uh, happened uh, in that case was uh, unacceptable. There has been a great deal of investigation uh, and lessons learned uh, that will be applied for the future. On the specific issue of fatal accident inquiries, and I absolutely understand the frustration that uh, families will often feel about the length of time uh, for fatal accident inquiries to uh, begin. Uh, the decision though, and I, I do hope Willie Rennie does understand this point, and I'm, I'm sure he will, the decision to hold a fatal accident inquiry, but also the time scale for initiating uh, the inquiry is a matter entirely for the Lord Advocate. And in this capacity, the Lord Advocate operates independently of government. So it would be uh, wrong, I think, for me to uh, seek to second guess uh, that decision-making process. Uh, depending upon the circumstances of a case, and I'm not talking about any particular case here, a death investigation can be complex, technical, and it can often involve a number of different uh, agencies. I know the Crown Office is committed to prompt investigations, but I also know that it accepts that in some cases the time taken to complete an investigation has been too long. Finally, the government has made additional funding available to the Crown Office um, and they are using some of that to allow the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit to try to reduce the time required to complete death investigations. I hope that is helpful uh, in uh, the way of an answer and I hope Willie Rennie is assured that this is an issue that both the Crown Office and the government take seriously. 
Willie Rennie. Uh, I understand that, but how can any lessons be learnt when it takes years to get the answers? It may be that the failure to maintain experienced call handlers in the Bilston Glen Police Service Centre is one of those lessons from the M9 crash. But mistakes are about to be made again at Bilston Glen, alongside other centres in Motherwell and Govan. Police staff on night and back shifts are about to lose thousands of pounds a year in changes to their shift allowances. I am told morale is at rock bottom. We cannot afford to drive experienced call handlers out of the police. So can the First Minister step in to prevent these damaging changes? First Minister. Well, th this is a change that is, of course, still under uh, discussion. Uh, the majority uh, of police staff will see uh, an increase, but nevertheless, these are important issues that the government must uh, properly consider. In terms of the points about uh, fatal accident inquiries, I've answered that uh, as fully uh, as I can, and I won't repeat uh, what I've already said. It is in the interest of everyone uh, that investigations and inquiries take place as quickly as possible, but it is also important uh, that the right uh, processes are followed. Uh, we do know that uh, the average uh, number of uh, days to complete uh, fatal accident inquiries is reducing. That's of no comfort to any family who's still waiting for one to start. But these are issues uh, we take seriously and continue to work with the Crown Office uh, to address. And uh, that is the case in terms of the other changes that Willie Rennie has mentioned. Thank you. For some further supplementaries, the first from Keith Brown. The First Minister may be aware that the um, Conservative Party spokesperson on Social Security this morning stated that there is no such thing as the bedroom tax. Given that the Scottish Government provides an average of £650 in bedroom tax relief for over 70,000 families in Scotland, is the First Minister concerned, as I am, that the Tories would take away this support for families in Scotland because they believe this tax does not even exist? Whoa. First Minister. Whoa. Well, I am. I am aware, I haven't seen uh, the details myself, but I am aware uh, that Michelle Ballantyne, the uh, Tories uh, Social Security Welfare spokesperson, uh, said at a committee this morning that the bedroom tax does not exist. I think that will come news to the many people that are subject uh, to the bedroom tax or would be subject to the bedroom tax, but for the mitigation action that this Scottish Government has taken to make sure that nobody uh, in Scotland has to pay the bedroom tax. Perhaps Michelle Ballantyne later on this afternoon will want to explain her comments. I would hope that Jackson Carlow would want to take a very close look at her comments. Uh, but it doesn't augur very well if the Tories don't even understand the basics of what people across the country are experiencing in terms terms of their welfare policies, then what chance do we have of persuading them to change them? It's an appalling comment if indeed it was made, and I hope uh, Michelle Ballantyne will retract it at the earliest opportunity. Anas Sarwar to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Anas Sarwar. Presenting officer, discrimination is more than just about hate crime. It impacts life chances and outcomes. Today, with the support of SPICE, I published a report which shows that Scotland's diverse minority communities are chronically underrepresented in the civil service and public sector bodies. Only 1.8% of civil servants are from a diverse background. Only 10 of the most senior posts are from a diverse background. And two thirds of local authorities employ less than 1% from a diverse background. So will the First Minister commit to a full and regular audit of Scotland's public sector? Will she support the implementation of the Rooney Rule, which means that at least one ethnic minority is shortlisted when a vacancy arises? And will she agree to expand the very welcome Gender Representation on Public Boards Act to ensure that our public sector bodies reflect Scottish society? First Minister. Well, let me say a couple of things quickly to that. Firstly, I absolutely agree with the sentiments uh, behind Anna Sarwar's question. In terms of the specifics he's asked me there, I will ask the Permanent Secretary to consider all of them, and I, I will be happy either myself or uh, ask the Permanent Secretary to write to him uh, on how we will take forward all the specific points there. Uh, but let me assure him and the entire Chamber uh, that the Scottish Government, as an employer, is absolutely determined uh, to increase uh, the numbers of ethnic minorities uh, working within the organisation. Uh, they are under represented in the Scottish Government uh, right now, as will be the case for many organisations and employers. And just as it is important that we re redress that imbalance in gender, it, it is also vital that we do so for ethnic minorities. And the Scottish Government, uh, as an employer, is absolutely committed to doing so and committed to encouraging other employers uh, to take similar action. 
Lee MacArthur, to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will recall that the Saltire Prize for Marine Energy was first launched in 2008 by her predecessor, Alex Salmond, amid characteristic fanfare. Mr Salmond then went on to relaunch the prize on a regular basis over subsequent years before it was quietly then abandoned, unclaimed, in 2017. Given the role that tidal energy needs to play in our future energy mix, as well as in meeting our climate change targets, what assurance can the First Minister give that the latest version of the Saltire Prize is actually winnable and not simply an exercise in window dressing? First Minister. Well, actually, I think this is a legitimate question for Liam MacArthur to have raised. The reason that we have uh, recast this prize is to make sure that it matches uh, developments in tidal energy. The uh, Saltire Prize was not doing that. That was uh, nothing to do with the situation uh, when that prize was launched. It's the developments of tidal energy have not uh, developed in a way that people then thought. So we are determined uh, to ensure uh, that this uh, recast initiative helps those who are seeking to develop tidal energy. Um, I, uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, as I have been promoting Scotland uh, internationally, have uh, spoken to uh, a number of people active in renewable energy and certainly some of them uh, that I've spoken to were very uh, warmly welcoming of uh, these changes because they thought it better reflected uh, the work that they were doing. So hopefully uh, Liam MacArthur can be reassured by that and we can all uh, get behind uh, renewable energy generally in Scotland but tidal energy in particular. Annie Wells. Thank you. On Saturday another shooting took place in Glasgow in Springburn, the area I live. And this is almost a year after the victim's brother was shot in the same street in one of the many shootings that have taken place in Glasgow over the last two years, something that I have raised in the chamber before. So can I ask the First Minister what action will be taken to reassure residents that steps are being taken to clamp down on gun crime? First Minister. Well, this is... Uh primarily of course an operational matter for Police Scotland. I know from uh, the discussions I have with Police Scotland that this is an issue. Gun crime and, and gang related crime uh, in the city of Glasgow is something that is a real priority for them. Uh, for the government's part uh, we have a duty to support police. That's why we're increasing uh, the revenue budget of Police Scotland to enable them uh, to do the job that they are uh, tasked to do. The Justice Secretary and I uh, are regularly briefed by Police Scotland on developments around serious and organised crime um, and this is an issue that I'm I'm sure will continue to be one of great priority uh, because I think that is required in order to give the kind of reassurance to people living in Glasgow which is uh, where I live and the, uh, where my constituency is um, and that's uh, an important point to, to have raised. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she'll provide an update on her recent visits to Canada, the United States and France. First Minister. Well, in the face of Brexit, it's never been more important to demonstrate that Scotland is an open, outward-looking country and that we're open for business. Um, I visited the, the US, Canada and France, uh, markets that are worth over £8 billion to Scotland's economy to promote us as an attractive place to invest, visit, work and live. During my visits, I opened new hubs in Canada and France, part of our programme for government commitments to grow our relationships with other countries, uh, and hosted events to promote Scottish food and drink. I met with companies including Marriott, Accor, Morgan Stanley, IBM and BNP Paribas, all important stakeholders in some of our key economic sectors. I also spoke at an event at the UN, hosted by the Assistant General, uh, Secretary General for Human Rights, to discuss Scotland's commitment to gender equality and human rights. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Does the First Minister agree that by promoting trade and investment and launching new innovation and investment hubs in Ottawa and Paris, the Scottish Government is working to show Scotland as an attractive place to invest, visit, work and live, and that Scotland is building positive international relationships as we are taking out of the European Union against their will? Instead of taking the isolationist view of the parochial Tories who quibble at any attempt by Scotland to raise its profile on the international stage, even as we strive to attract investment and jobs into Scotland. First Minister. Well, it's always been important for First Ministers to represent and promote the country abroad. Uh, by coincidence, uh, Edinburgh Airport, when I was going to France on Monday, I ran into Jack McConnell, who was reminding me about how important it was when he was uh, First Minister. Um, and it's even more important now uh, because of Brexit. So I make no apology. I will continue to do everything I can to promote Scotland abroad. Interestingly, the Tories have been criticising it. I noticed that the Secretary of State for Scotland actually seems to agree with me rather 
them with them. In the last couple of years uh, alone, uh, David Mundell has visited uh, Iceland, the USA, Uruguay, Chile, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Japan, Norway, Paraguay, Argentina, Germany, Belgium, Myanmar, and Singapore. And do you know what? I back him to do it. I think the only question is why did nobody notice he was gone? Yeah. <laughs> question number five, Jimmy Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that alterations have been made to ScotRail's satisfaction targets over the last two years. First Minister. Uh, the Government puts the interests of uh, the passenger first, which is why the franchise contract includes requirements to meet passenger satisfaction targets. Only a few rail franchises uh, require this. Uh, the government holds ScotRail to account for matters within the franchisee's control, uh, but it's only reasonable and required contractually that we also take account of impacts beyond the control of the franchisee. The targets for overall satisfaction have been adjusted as required by the contract for two reasons. Firstly, to take account of a change in survey methodology by passenger focus, uh, and secondly, to take account of increased disruption levels from extended route closures due to track renewal works in the Queen Street Tunnel and delayed electrification works. The extent and impact of this disruption Option was not known at the time of the bids for the ScotRail franchise. Jamie Green. ScotRail's contractual satisfaction target is 88.5%, but over the past two years, the Scottish Government dropped these targets to 84 and 85%, and surprise, surprise, the operator met the newly lowered targets, and thus avoiding triggering an event of default. We also know that ScotRail is unlikely to meet its PPM performance targets, perhaps for months, if not years, to come. The First Minister told this chamber in December that services were unacceptable and she apologised to passengers for dismal performance. What message does the First Minister think it sends to any franchise holder that moving the goalposts and lowering the targets is how this government will deal with it not meeting its contractual obligations? And given that satisfaction is at a 15-year low, passengers have had repeated apologies Question, from this government. What is the First Minister's message to passengers today. First Minister. Well, firstly, as I said a moment ago, the ScotRail franchise is one of just a very few rail franchises to actually uh, require uh, them to meet passenger satisfaction targets. I think that's a good thing. Um, in, terms of, in terms of amendments uh, or adjustments, I I'm not sure if Jamie Green is seriously uh, proposing that uh, ScotRail should be held to account for factors that are outside of its control, factors that are down to the failure of Network Rail, for example, which is not devolved uh, to this Parliament. But thirdly, uh, and finally, Presiding Officer, we do continue to hold uh, ScotRail to account. Uh, the results of the National Rail Passenger Survey led to a formal remedial plan notice being issued by Transport Scotland on the 8th of February, uh, requiring them to submit a, a remedial plan. So we've got robust arrangements in place, and the Scottish Government it will do what requires to be done to ensure that ScotRail is held to account against them. Richard Lyle. Can the First Minister give an indication of what proportion of any delays are linked to Network Rail? And would the First Minister agree that it's high time that opposition members, MSPs in this Parliament, join in the call for the full devolution of Scotland's railways? First Minister. Well, the opposition... The opposition don't like this, yeah. but Richard Lyle's question is absolutely on the money because the KPI target for overall satisfaction was adjusted to take account of increased disruption caused by the delay to network rails electrification works. Uh, the adjustment also took account of the delay to track renewal works in the Queen Street Tunnel. Again, that's the responsibility of network rail. These issues are out with Scott Rail's control. They are out with the control of the Scottish Parliament, given responsibility for network rail, is not devolved. And overall, more than half of the delays on the network over the past year have been the responsibility of network rail. So if the opposition want us to be able to do more about this, then they need to get behind our calls to devolve network rail to this parliament. Mike Rumbles. First Minister, it's no good blaming network rail. Uh, <laughs> half, half of the problems with network rail are down to weather and they don't change. Question, please. We've heard that customer satisfaction rates have dropped to a 15-year low. That's, that's the customer. And performance indicators are still well below the level where financial penalties should have been levelled by this government. 
and they provide an unacceptable service still. Would the First Minister accept that the public have lost confidence in Abellio as the operator of the £7 billion ScotRail franchise and the franchise should be ended at the first break point in the contract? First Minister. Firstly, ScotRail should be held to account uh, where it fails, uh, and it is held to account. ScotRail uh, is fined where that is appropriate for failures in its performance. Uh, secondly, in terms of the franchise, of course, it's only down to the actions of this government. This was opposed for a long time by the unionist parties uh, in this parliament that we now do have the power to ensure a public sector bid for franchises in future. But uh, Mike Rumbles is not seriously suggesting, as I think he was there, that when more than half of the delays on the network are the responsibility of Network Rail, then we shouldn't blame Network Rail. Let's hold Scott Rail to account when it's their failures to blame, but let's hold Network Rail to account when it's them to blame. And let's give ourselves the ability to properly hold them to account by devolving responsibility to this Parliament. Question number six, Polly McNeill. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government plans to take to help vulnerable energy consumers. First Minister. Well, we're disappointed that the UK government continually fails to create an energy market that serves consumers fairly, particularly the most vulnerable. Uh, as the member knows, fuel costs are the biggest driver of fuel poverty, and not one we have power over. Where we do have powers, we're taking action, including bringing forward the Fuel Poverty Bill and our Energy Efficiency Route Map. Uh, we're pleased of Gem's latest findings show that no customers were disconnected in Scotland in 2017, and fewer Scottish customers are repaying energy debts, but I still believe that more should be done. Uh, that's why we've recently written to the CEOs of the big six energy companies urging them to build on this and inviting them to engage with us on how we can support more people. Polly McNeill. Almost one quarter of people are already living in fuel poverty but on April the 1st more than one million households in Scotland are looking at an average £110 increase a year rise in their bills after the energy walk watchdog of them increase the cap for those on the default otherwise known as the variable tariff. It questions whether or not you can argue there's a cap any longer but the energy companies are supposed to have a priority services register but there's currently no standard qualifying criteria for a vulnerable household. I'm pleased that the First Minister has said that she Question has written to the big you. six companies. Will she further pressurise them to ensure that they do have a strategy for vulnerable customers and try to force to take them on the highest tariffs to protect their interests. First Minister. Well, firstly, I actually agree uh, with Polly McNeill. I agree with her point about the cap. The cap is controlled by the UK government. We don't have control over that. But yes, we will continue to engage with the energy companies uh, to persuade and encourage uh, them to do everything they can to help vulnerable uh, customers. And we'll take whatever other action we can within our power uh, to help uh, vulnerable customers because uh, the increases that she has referred to are completely and utterly unacceptable. Question number seven, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish uh, task First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the youth strike for climate. First Minister. Well, the threat of climate change uh, can sometimes, I think, seem overwhelming, but I think we should all be optimistic both about Scotland's record in almost halving our emissions uh, and the actions of young people last week. Uh, given the impact climate change will have on young people, it is essential that we listen to them carefully. I'd certainly be happy to meet with the students and have asked my officials to uh, work with them to try to facilitate that. The targets proposed in our climate change bill mean Scotland will be carbon neutral by 2050. Last week, the Committee on Climate Change informed us that their next advice on targets will be published on the 2nd of May. If they say that we can now responsibly and credibly set a date to achieve net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases, then we will do so. Ross Greer. I thank the First Minister for that answer and for her words of support for the young people who took strike action both on the day itself and today. But as the First Minister herself has previously acknowledged, we're well beyond the point where words are sufficient to deal with this crisis. The young people that I was with in Glasgow on Friday had one key demand, keep it in the ground. So on their behalf, can I ask the First Minister if she acknowledges, if the Scottish Government acknowledge, the indisputable scientific reality that the overwhelming majority of oil and gas reserves in the North Sea and elsewhere must stay there unburnt. 
First Minister. Well, we certainly understand the importance of the transition from fossil fuels to a carbon neutral economy, and we support that in so many different ways. At the heart of our proposals, of course, is the concept of just transition, uh, to make sure that workers in one industry are not left behind as we make that transition. And I absolutely hope that uh, all members in this chamber would understand the importance of getting that balance right. But absolutely, uh, in terms of tackling climate change, there is no bigger priority. Scotland is already leading the way and we want to make sure we continue to do so. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. And could I thank the First Minister and most of the contributors for their brevity. We're going to move on to uh, members' business in the name of Jamie Green on delivering sustainable and renewable transportation for Scotland. But we'll just take a few moments. In fact, we'll have a short suspension while the member and ministers and the gallery changes. A short suspension.